Welcome back, welcome back, welcome to property. Let's start. Welcome to property two. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you in class. Um, first off, the attendance will be done with the Reef Clicker. If you haven't already downloaded the app, please do so. It gives you a free two-week trial, then it's a 10 or 15 bucks for the semester. Uh, I'll have this open to start every class for attendance. If you don't have a phone, uh, you can use your computer. If you don't have a phone or a computer, uh, you can talk to me after we'll figure something else out. Um, second off, uh, I have a gift for all of you. Um, what, uh, when I first started teaching many years ago, the first day of class was my birthday, and I brought in cookies, and then every semester since I've done the same. Um, one semester I actually forgot to bring cookies, so I said, you didn't bring us cookies, so now uh, I have uh, lots of cookies for everyone. Uh, so please, use from Costco, they're very good. Pass these around, enjoy them. Uh, I don't want to bring any home, so please finish all of them. Uh, if you have any left over, bring them around, okay? Oh, wait, I'm not going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very sorry. All right. That's number one. Calm down, calm down, calm down. Number two, uh, I have a seating chart for you to pass around. And number three, I have some. Okay, so the seating chart's here. I'll put this on this side. Um, number four, I'd like for all of you to make little tent cards like this. I have blank ones. Um, write your name in big, legible letters. If there's a nickname or something else you want me to call you, put that. This one is what I'm going to call you this semester. Um, so I'll pass these around, I'll pass around markers. Uh, please write your name in a legible fashion, and uh, this way I'll know who you are uh, fairly. Start some of here. All right, I think that's it. And um, I'm Josh, so welcome. All right, um, any other questions before we get started? Do we need our phones for anything else other than the... Uh, you'll need it for a poll question, which I need to start the class with. Not for today, but for next class. No poll question today. Anything else in your minds? All right. Well, now we got that out of the way, and about 46 of you managed to check in. Very good. Um, welcome to property two. Uh, uh, one. <laughs> sorry. Welcome to property one. Yeah. Oh, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. Uh, I teach both of the classes. It's actually funny. My first year of teaching, um, I taught property one and two, and I uh, almost inverted which I was teaching first. I almost walked in working the wrong way, but you guys are good. So, welcome to property one. Um, this is a different class than you've taken before. This is not like contracts, it's not like civil procedure. If you notice, there's no federal rules of property, right? Those are restatement of property they assigned you. There's no uniform property code. Um, this is a class where black letter law is a lot less helpful. And that makes a lot of students uncomfortable. There are very few four-factor tests in this class. There are very, much fewer rules you have to memorize to recite. Um, this class, more than others, is about case law. Because property has long developed as an attribute of the common law. Okay? Property also isn't what you thought it would be. It's not about real estate law. It's not about buying and selling houses. We do that stuff in property, too. Property, too, is a lot more practical. Um, property one, however, focuses on a lot more high-level ideas. Okay? So what I'm going to do first is walk you through the syllabus and give you a preview of what you can expect in this class. Okay? So by now you should all see the syllabus. Uh, I won't be using Stanley. I uh, won't use it again uh, other than email you. So if you want to know what's going on, you go to my website, joshblackman.com, there's a link for classes, and that will take you. Uh, 
for the class, we're using a ninth edition of the uh, Duke Meteor book. Some of you emailed me. They change the book every three years. Um, property doesn't change every three years. But unfortunately, the eighth edition won't work for you. They actually made some really significant changes I wasn't happy with. I sent the author a nasty note. Uh, but they, 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 property is, in constitutional law, it changes every couple of years. Not property, but they, they need to make money. And the way this works is, oh, it's true. The bookstore downstairs, I've asked, will not let me stock an old book. Right? I said, can you just sell the eighth edition? Like, no, we won't do it. Okay, so you're stuck with the ninth. Um, the class will have a midterm. Um, I will grade it. It's basically going to be graded A, B, C, D, but it's a pass-fail. And that if you fail the midterm, I reserve the right to lower the dissertation <coughs> score. The midterm is roughly halfway through the semester. I think it's class 14 or 15. Um, after the midterm, I will meet with every one of you. Everyone has to make an appointment to meet with me. Uh, I have 160 students a semester. It's most I've ever had. You have a very, very big uh, class. But you all meet with me, we'll go over it. The exam is completely open book. You can bring whatever you want, it will not help you. <laughs> Trust me, it's not going to help you at all. Uh, so, supplements, form books, it's not going to help you. Um, I have posted all of my old property one exams and midterms for the last six or so years. Um, at some point this semester, you should take all of them. The easiest way to do well in this class is to take my old exams. Okay. Uh, attendance, again, I will take it every day. This is the eye clicker. It's very good. It tells me who's not here. Uh, it's probably even more than that. If you can't figure it out today, talk to me after class. But uh, after this, I'm not going to pass around a roll sheet. This will be the official attendance um, record. Okay. Uh, I will also start class with a polling question using the same clicker app. Um, these are questions designed to bridge the gap. So, you know, we have class on Thursday today. Will anybody remember on Tuesday what we learned today? Probably not. So the purpose of the questions is to connect you from class on Thursday to class on Tuesday, etc. cetera. Um, these questions aren't graded. And I'm not going to give you a bad grade if you get the wrong an answer wrong. Um, instead, I'll simply check, are you doing it? If I find people are skipping the questions or coming in late, that can hurt you. So show up, answer the questions. Uh, they're almost all true, false, multiple choice, and uh, that will get you going. Uh, my office hours are right before this class and also right after. If you want to be with me after class, you're welcome to. But the posted ones are from uh, 12.45 to 1.45, so right before this. Um, if you want to contact me, my email address is there. Uh, I'm very quick on email, as some of you may have already recognized. Um, also, I record my classes. That little funny thing there is a camera, uh, the live stream. Um, this is not a substitute for attendance. If you're not here, you're marked absent. But if for whatever reason you're on a moot court trip and you can't attend class, it's live streamed. You can watch it as well. I've also posted all the lectures from past years. What a lot of students do, and usually the students who score the highest scores, is they'll, they'll watch the class from last year before coming to class this year. Um, I can only ask so many questions. Odds are I'm going to repeat questions. So if you want to be prepared for class, you can watch the lectures from last year. And I'll even give you a hint. On YouTube, there's a feature to watch it at double speed. Whoa. So you can watch it, yeah. So you can watch a 40, I'm sorry, 90 minute lecture in 45 minutes. Um, I strongly encourage you to do that. The other advantage is you can actually take some notes watching the video. And that way you're not like, you know, smacking the keyboard and not stopping class. Pay attention a little more. So if you have time on the bus or on the commute, plug into your car sound system, listen to the lecture. A lot of students do that during their commute. If you're a long commute, I encourage you. It's a good way to pass time. I might put you to sleep, but uh, it, it's somewhat enjoyable. All right, what else? OK. Um, one attribute of this class, which I'm very proud of, we stay on schedule. Uh, I've never once fallen behind. Whatever I say we're going to cover on that day, we're going to cover that day. And I finish everything on time. So you know with precision exactly what we'll be covering on every single day. That means no excuses, right? You know what's covered, you know what you have to read, and it's not going to work if you say you're not prepared. Um, the way I do recitations is a little bit differently. No one raises hands. Um, I go up and down the rows. I'll start here, I go up this row, and up this row, and up this row, all the way around. I can probably call on 50 people in one class. I can probably call on almost half of you. And you don't always know which way I'm going to cut, like a left, like a right. So 
you're basically on call every day. Um, the flip side is, I don't dwell on people for 30 minutes at a time. Uh, you might get two questions, maybe three, maybe one, depending on how I'm feeling. But you're probably going to be called on every single day. Um, if I call and you're not prepared, I'll come back to you. Once, twice, three times, however many it takes to get you the right answer. But I'll come back to me out of order as well. So I encourage you to be prepared. Um, you'll find the readings are reasonable. 20 pages on average a day, maybe 25 pages at max, but 20 pages of reading a day is actually fairly low, much less than I give my poor comm law students, but there's a lot less to uh, learn in this class. All right, uh, let me walk you through now the semester. Um, we teach this class somewhat out of order. The very first stuff we teach you is how to acquire property. Not what <laughs> property is, but how to acquire it. It's a little bit backwards. <coughs> Only later do we actually get to the topic of how to define property. So today we discuss how to get property from nature, in the commons. Uh, in the next class on Tuesday, we discuss how to take animals and other sorts of wildlife from the wild. Uh, then we do a very important case about foxes and how to hunt foxes. This is one of my favorite classes of the year. Uh, then we go on uh, discussing oil and gas. We we'll have a full class, and this is just but a brief three-page survey uh, and how to create property, what might be called intellectual property. Uh, there's not a class on the 25th. Um, on the 30th, property in yourself. You have a right to your own organs. Then we move on to something called a bundle of sticks. Now, property is not a single block, but various attributes to find ownership. And it's about finding <coughs> stuff, right? Finding is different than hunting, finders, keepers. We talk about gifts, how to get presents, no class on the 13th. Okay, then we move on to probably the hardest point of the semester, which is called future interests, right? Any given piece of property has owners at various points in time. Who owns it today? And who owns it in the future? This is basically half the semester. Various types of what are called estates or interest in properties will give you the most trouble. We also spend the most time on it. Okay? And we do that for about a month. Uh, your midterm is on the uh, 6th of March. We'll be in class, 90 minutes. And then you have your spring break. Okay? It actually breaks nicely. When we get back from spring break, we'll talk about co ownership. Roommate, you have a current tenant, current owner. We'll do a couple classes on marital property. You will again take another class on mar marital property later this semester. And in our final few classes, we'll go at leases. I'm sure many of you have signed leases. Uh, and then talk about the landlord tenant relationship. And that'll take us all the way to a review session, which I have tentatively slotted for our last day of class in the 20th. Questions about the schedule? Uh, yes, sir. Is that what's that name? Uh, Marcos. You got to write much bigger than that. Oh, uh, well. Take another one after you. Yeah. I mean, you got to really. The letters have to fill up the entirety, otherwise I can't read your name. So if you want to do it on the other side, yeah, really, and thick letters too. If they're really skinny ones, that's not going to work. So really big. I didn't wear glasses when I started teaching, now I do. So increasingly the letters have to get bigger and bigger and bigger in this door. Anyway, yes, sir, Marco. Yep, throw them, throw them this way. Uh, yeah, I just have a question about uh, some of the topics. Is there math in this class? Math? Why do you ask? Uh, I don't know, I'm just asking. Why are you asking? Uh, I know why you're asking. Why I, saw, you tell me? I mean, I know sometimes when you talk about property, there's like, you know, depreciation and all that stuff and there's numbers you have and to count yes yes <laughs> so can I'm you just, count oh yeah i know how to count I'm just, I'm you're, you're prepared <laughs> you don't need a calculator okay good you have to count years though <laughs> can you count to 21 uh yes i think it'll be good shape <laughs> yes what else you have a question for you sorry yeah, yeah. Ni nice and big so like in other words if, if you can read this it's the right size if you can't read this okay uh, one other note about this class before we get started. Um, you're not just going to blankly memorize rules, right? What's a, what's a battery on one to touch, right? What, whatever it happens to be. Um, you're going to have to make arguments and craft arguments. And I'm going to give you a lot of tools to make these sorts of arguments. But this is not the sort of class about what is the four-factor test for this and that. You're not going to find a lot of that in this class. Okay. Um, as well, the class has a blog, so if you go uh, to my website, you'll see a list of property one, 
And I always put pictures and various attributes of the case. Uh, I love humanizing the law. It's very sterile otherwise. Uh, so I always bring in pictures of John Marshall. That's John Locke, which is Mr. Burns. It's not. Um, <laughs> uh, but we'll have lots of photographs as well. All right, what else? Anything else in your mind? There aren't any more than There are no more. There, I, there were 100 in that pack. There were 100. There are 85 of you. So let's see, Marcus. If I had 100 <laughs> in the pack, and there are 86 students in the, semester, in, the, in, the, in the class, how many extra games would there be? Wait, you said 100? 100, <laughs> right? 100 minus 85? Yeah. Six. That's 15. Okay, so <laughs> we should not run out. If somebody took the entire sheet and did it wrong, there were two per page. All right. Anything else non name tag related? Okay. All right, can I start? Let's start the actual class. Oh, oh, I oh. Uh, yes, now what's your name? I can't name that quite yet. Megan. Megan, yeah. Um, I saw on your uh, website that you have like um, a drive for class notes. Is that something that you do like after yes. class? Yes, yeah, so um, on every class there will be a link for the class notes. So like there's a link. If you notice, it's blank. Because I haven't made them yet. What I do is I type in real time. And I develop the notes as we go on. So the documents all start off as blank. And then at the end of the semester, there'll be lots of stuff in them. So keep, keep track of this, right? If you don't have a computer, that's fine. I put the notes up here so you can see what I'm typing. All right. All right, anyone else? All right, Brooke, I'm sorry. You're first. Okay. But this one's going to be easy, right? Uh, you have your book? Yes. Good. Uh, go to page 667, please. It wasn't your reading, but it's a good read. All right, 667. And if you haven't have your book yet, I've on the screen. Um, I want you to uh, I want you to read this passage with this gentleman. Is it on our page six sixty seven? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sorry, there, yes. Sir. I swear, if this was Alabama, it'd probably roll tide, right? So, um, <laughs> let, oh, too soon. Um, so, Brooke, what's what's going on there? What I mean, I gave this to you without any context whatsoever. What what's going on here? Okay, is it Sam? Sam? Yeah, Sam. Uh, see, these name cards are great. I don't need a little stupid chart. Um, I, I used to scrutinize them this good. So I can look right at your face and those things. So, Sam, uh, let me ask you another question. What is property? Ooh. What is property? Some questions related to the classical property. Josh, what's land? 
I, I, I realize I'm using the very silly here, but this is a perfect thing. What, what is property? What is land? What, what are we talking about here? It could be real estate. It could be... You're talking about a house now. It, it could be real estate. So is property the stuff that's under the house or not the stuff? It's, it's everything. It's the minerals found on the property. What, we <coughs> what about the air over the land? Is, is, that, is, that, is that property also? Mm -hmm. So if I fly to Rome over your house, right? Have mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right? Who is it? Is it Matt, we got like the record. Yeah. 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 Fix that later. Yeah. So Matt, um, why does property have to be owned by someone? Why do we, you know, she said who owns it? Why, why does property have to be owned in the first place? <coughs> why not? No, but you're, 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 you're circling my question. Why, why does property have to be owned in the first place? The way I talk about the way that you define property, right? So what about the ocean? You want to own the ocean? <coughs> so it's not property. What about forest? Public forest. But does that mean you can enter the park by yourself? Do you need permission to enter a public park? Any day out of like hours, you can enter this house. But, but, if, but if someone else owns a property, how can you're allowed to enter? The government owns it. Why, why, why are you allowed to enter? Someone else owns it. I, if the government owns it, I have partial ownership in that. How so? I'll tell you for another state. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the reason, I promise. Let's see. Oh, God, Joey got to get bigger. Yeah. Joey, um, why do we have ownership of property? What purpose does it serve? What do you mean? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Like, say you own a parcel of land, or there's a parcel of land, uh -huh. and you've got a larger population. If somebody has the ownership of that land, they can cut down the board and disperse the wood. Yeah, but why, why should whoever owns the land have that exclusive right? You know, if I want some trees, why can't I go into this guy's property and chop down some trees? Well, what's, what's wrong with that? I need the trees to sustain. Why should you have a monopoly on it? Well, under that idea, um, so, is that something? Yes. Something, ma'am. How are property rights assigned? How, how do you acquire property? By person. Okay, how did that person get? By Yeah. How do you find property? I mean, I, I, I asked a question, right? So I, she, 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 she sold what I was going through, but she, she cut it out, right? But the question is this, right? How do I buy property? I buy it from Jones, right? Where did Jones get? He got from Smith. Where did Smith got? Smith got from Bill. Okay, eventually, right, you keep going back and back and back. So the question for you is, is where does the first owner get it from? The first person to change. The first person. Yeah. Or let's say land, like the like North American things. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess maybe finding it. Like, mm -hmm. Or <coughs> uh, conquering. Con 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 you're 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 absolutely on the right track. Um, is that uh, Caitlin? Yeah. Who? How does the first person get property? Where does it come from? How, how is it assigned? It's not assigned until someone finds it. Is finding it adequate? Says who? It says the European. European? Why, why do they get to decide what the rule is? Uh, because they have more power than they will. Oh, okay. So, Nikisha, is it simply whoever finds it first gets it? Is, that, is, that, is, this, the, is this the rule? Is this, is this a rule of law? <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You said someone else is already there. What's Nikisha, what's missing from this chronology over here? Something's missing. There's a very big thing missing from this. Right, look, let, let, let's recap, right? It says uh, uh, US got it from France, France got it from Spain, Spain got it from Columbus's discovery. Columbus was authorized by the Queen of Spain. The Queen of Spain got the blessing from the Pope. The Pope is representative of Jesus, therefore Jesus made Louisiana, right? 
that's a very, 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 very cute chronology. What, what, what's missing there? Yeah, there are native people there who were hanging out before 1492. Plumbus Eliosh, right? So, that, and that's basically the basis of our first case. Uh, let's go to the back. Is that a, uh, can't be that, uh, yeah, read. Okay, very good, thank you. This block, not the, the size is actually very good. Yeah, if you put your computer, it's actually ideal. Um, so, read, let me ask this question. Um, who decided that Columbus's discovery was enough to appropriate the land? Who made, who made that decision? Was there a statute? Was there a um, uh, some sort of ruling by a legislature? Where did this where did this rule come from? And where did they get this idea from, though? Um, because nobody could tell them that they didn't have that idea. No, I, I see where you're going with that, but there's a different answer, right? Ryan, where did this idea come from? That the first in time, the first person to acquire land for discovery gets it. Where, where did this idea come from? It wasn't just entirely a, a fabricated idea. It was, there was some stuff behind it. And if you look at New England years ago, you can all the way back to like, the Roman Empire. Like, whenever there was unoccupied land, it would just be for themselves. So how did the Europeans understand this concept? What, what, what kind of thought was given to this? In the reading is responsive to my question about where this, these sort of ideas came from. discussed in this chapter that consider these topics? No, 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 no. Rob? No, they're not going to help you. It's you. <laughs> oh, I'm not happy about this. Ash, want to try again? John Locke is one of them. Yeah, that took five people. It should have taken one. This is the sort of recitation you're going to get, so be ready. Um, there were a lot of thinkers of what the period called the Enlightenment. Right? I even showed you his picture before, right? The Mr. Burns guy, right? <laughs> and there were a lot of thinkers who considered these questions, right? It's certainly true, I think a couple of you mentioned that this was nearly an attribute of power. Might makes right. That European settlers had guns and, and, and cannons and steel and other things, and natives had nothing. They had bows and arrows, right? They, they, they couldn't mount effective resistance. So in that sense, yeah, they're more powerful so they can ascribe the rule. But that's not the only lesson I want you to take away from today. There were philosophers. John Locke was one of them. All right, now let's try this again. Uh, Ryan, what was John Locke's theory? Was it the complex theory? Where um, if you find something in concrete, it's worse? Give me a little bit more. What, what, how would you describe Locke's understanding of property acquisition. There's a discussion in your notes. I don't, I don't know where this book is. Where's this nature law book? Um, no one else needs to sign this thing? Got it? You got it? Yeah. Jake's still on. What, what's this law of nature? I guess, uh, well, it says here that uh, inferior creatures common to all men. 
Yeah, yeah, okay, so so instead of reading, um, just to, we're, this is not yelling at you, but don't, don't read from your book. You can do that at home. I want you to discuss your own words. What's this, do you know the answer? Uh, I guess like, trying to try to put it in words, like, um, how like, more like, how like, you have more how like, something like this to get away from the other uncivilized. Right. Esther, what are these laws of nature? Uh, I'm sorry, you gotta talk louder. Okay. Very good. And please louder. What is a social contract? What use this word? Very, very good phrase. What does that mean? <laughs> speaks of this idea of a state of nature, right? What is this state of nature? What does that mean? No, you know? Okay, you gotta write that bigger. Is that the tool? Yes. Okay, just make it bigger later, okay? Okay. Batul, what is, if there are any markers, just send them, send them back. Uh, Batul, what is this state of nature that Locke discussed? I can't hear you. That's not an excuse. Okay, Melissa, what is a state of nature? Okay, everyone. Um, this is not a good auspicious start. You need to do better. Right? Just because something's in a note and not a case, you still have to read it. Okay? Roxy, what's a state of nature? Anyone? Give me a hand, please. That hasn't been improved upon or put into use by man yet. Okay, good. Locke theorizes that at some time in the very distant past, before government, there was a state of nature where indeed men were savages. They were fighting with each other. Okay? <clears throat> well, let's try this. What's the problem with the state of nature where people are fighting with each other all the time? Why is that problematic? What... What, what is that going to create for society? Yeah, I talk louder. Right, and what's, what's one of the problems that Locke discussed that happens when everyone's fighting all the time? Roxy? Think, right? What's a problem people are always fighting in connection with what we're learning about? Why is that problematic? No, okay, and as a result, what has that effect on property? Yes, right? So imagine the situation. I'm on a deserted island, right? Everyone's the movie Tom Hanks Castaway, right? The Robinson Crusoe, you read that in high school? Right? Uh, is that Natalia? Yeah. Natalia, you're on a deserted island, right? It's just you and the coconut trees. <clears throat> Are there any problems about ownership of property there? Else. Right. Is anyone going to take your stuff? So if you go fishing, right, and you catch a couple fish, and you can't eat them all right away, so you hang them up on a tree overnight. Are you going to worry about someone else stealing your fish? No, you're on a deserted island. You're on a desert island, right? No problem. Everyone with me, right? All right. Uh, is that, I can't see that. Uh, Edwin? Yeah. Edwin, okay. You're on a desert island all by yourself. Things are great. Someone else washes on shore. Okay. So now there's two people on the island. Has that changed your situation? Yes, if they potentially want to come and steal some fish that I caught or vice versa. Do you trust this person? Not necessarily. You washed on shore? You know who the guy is, right? Yeah. So what might you and this other person do to prevent this sort of fear, right? Because imagine this, if you're afraid he's gonna watch you steal your fish at night, you're not gonna go to sleep, you're gonna be standing by the fish all night, you're gonna be wasting your time, not gonna much sleep. Let's say there's only one source of fresh water and you're afraid he's gonna take empty out the well. What can you and this other guy do, Edwin, to prevent this sort of fighting, what Locke describes as the state of nature? What, what can you do? Uh, 
try and divide it? Well, what's one what's one easy thing you could do for us to get a little bit too civilized? What? <laughs> uh, Marcos, what could you do to make this really easy? Uh, you could just talk. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, you're two Marcos. I'm sorry. The one right over there. Oh, okay. That's cool. Well, you, you can come to an agreement. No, no, no. You're, you're thinking way too civilized. What could you do short of. Kill him. Kill him, right? <laughs> kill him. You kill him, and then you go back to being by yourself. This is what Locke was discussing, right? When you're in an actual state of nature, and there's limited resources in the wild, you're going to kill each other, right? You're going to fight to the death and make sure the guy doesn't take your damn fish. <coughs> Everyone see that? Now, Andres, is that an effective way of managing society where basically everyone just kills each other? Is, is that something that anyone would conceivably want in the world? No. Okay, good. Right? We all agree on that. If you want to kill each other, go have fun. But I think it's not a productive manner. You spend all your time killing people. It's not a, you know, it's not a good use of your, of, your, of your resources. So short of Andres killing each other, you got two guys on the island. You have a limited amount of fish. You have a limited amount of water. What can be done? Well, you can collaborate and try to find the new ideas in order to like ration out the food or like maybe like, uh -huh. resources. What do you mean, rat? What kind of ideas are you talking about here? Collaborate, collaborative ideas. Yeah, like what? Give me an example. How would how would you? Let's just make it easier. You have one well of water, which is you know doesn't have that much in it, and then you have you know a limited amount of fish in the sea. What kind of rule could you uh, could you impose? Think think it through. You have like set limited quantities that each person could oh. use the well. Like so maybe you can like, uh, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I go to the well, on Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday, you know, something like that maybe? Mm -hmm. And maybe I fish on this day and he fishes on that day. Okay. I like that. Now, Demetrius, right? Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that the other guy actually follows a plan, right? Let's say his fishing day is on Monday, but then when you're not paying attention, he goes on Tuesday and starts fishing in your, in your lake, right? What do you do about that? Go uh, occupy <laughs> his job and take whatever I can. Oh, so you go and you take the fish back from him, right? And then what do you do when when, when he starts taking your fish? What's going to happen then? You're going to kill each other, right? You see how this goes back to killing very quickly, right? How do you keep the other guy honest? Or actually, why are you going to stay honest, right? Maybe the other guy's not being moral. Maybe you're the jerk, right? You're hungry. You're not catching enough fish on every other day. You say, screw this. I don't care about this guy. We go catch my fish seven days a week. You see the problem? Eventually, you kill each other, right? Is that Khadija? Oh, Khadija. Thank you, Khadija. Thank you, um, Khadija. Let's say you have these two people. They work out this agreement, right? And it's working well enough. And then some third guy washes ashore. Is he bound by this little contract you raised? Did he take any part in this negotiation? Or what could this third person just do? Kill everyone, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he could just yank the fish. You see where I'm going with this, right? <coughs> eventually, third person washes the shore, fourth person washes the shore, fifth, you know, eventually now you have 100 people on the island, right? At this point, you can't kill everyone, right? There's only limited resources, right? So, Kendall, let's say there are now 100 people living on this island. What do you do? What's, what's the. What's the way you prevent fish from being stolen at night? People just murdering each other. What could you possibly do? And what if those rules are violated? That's the key. <laughs> <laughs> well, who kills them? Actually, you're on the right track. We give a lynch mob, we just kill them? What happens? What does civilization do in this case? No, 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 no. What are you going to do if there's a problem of fish being stolen at night? What? Instead of everyone watching your fish, what could happen? <coughs> what would we call that person? A cop. <laughs> a police officer, right? Now, that police officer is not going to have time to fish, right? Will he? But he's watching everyone and keeping everyone safe. So how, what do we give that police officer? Oh, and, and then, so people have to give up their own fish to pay for this police force? <coughs> what would we call that? Someone said it. A tax. Right. Oh, a tax. And how do you make sure people pay that tax? What well, if they don't pay the tax? You kill them, right? Yeah. You, you kill them. This is Locke's theory, grossly condensed, of how civilization emerged. 
Um, this never actually happened, right? The, the sort of hypothetical I'm describing for you, this was no actual historical point in time. But this is Locke's theory. You start off in this state of nature, everyone's killing each other to fight for limited resources. People recognize this is not working. Let's form a contract. Uh, that's right, he says social contract, right? A social contract to deal with this problem of property. According to Locke, the basis of property, <coughs> right? Government exists to protect property. The reason why governments are formed is to provide protection of your fish, of your water, of your other resources. That's why government's formed. And then what government does is there's an executive power that says, if you break the rules, you steal this guy's fish, we come after you. Now, maybe it's not the death penalty, maybe it's something a little bit less serious. But government exists to protect property. That's why Locke believes social compact theory exists. So this idea, though, right, of I find property, therefore it's mine, it's not merely a reflection of power, and it certainly is, but a reflection of belief that the fairest way to allocate property is whoever finds it first. If I find this fish, or I hunt this fox, or something else, and I take it from the wild, it's mine. And this new government we created will protect that property right. So if I'm the first person to hunt this fish, or catch a fish, or hunt the fox, right? It's mine. And that is what these rules of nature, which are reason from the principle, provide. If this first in time principle applies to animals, which we'll study next class, it also applies to land. The discovery of new land, according to these principles, means you are the first in time owner and it's yours. Right? So, this doctrine of acquisition by discovery, right? Acquisition by discovery is premised on Locke. That by discovering it, by being the first person to sight a piece of land, you're the first guy on the deserted island, right? No one else has ever been there. It's yours. And that government exists to protect that right that you've acquired by being the first in time. This is what's known as the first in time principle. The first in time principle. In fact, John Locke wrote in his second treatise on government, quote, thus in the beginning all the world was America. He viewed America as a sort of primal state of nature that was ripe for discovery, and for conquest. Now, the biggest problem, again, with our uh, God made Louisiana hypothetical, and I think uh, Nikisha, said, Nikisha said a few minutes ago, right? People were there, right? People were there. They were living there for many, many years. The natives. Okay? How do you account for property of people already living there? The first doctrine, right, is discovery by, I'm sorry, acquisition by discovery, right? Acquisition by discovery. You can imagine that a volcano erupts in the ocean, right, and a new island forms in the ocean. Okay, you can discover that piece of land. I'll give you that. But everywhere in the world is occupied. I mean, virtually every place on Earth is occupied. This leads to the second doctrine. Uh, hold on, where am I? That's, uh, is that Zach? Thank you, sir. What's the second doctrine? Not acquisition by discovery. What's the other doctrine we're talking about today? Uh, Capture. Oh, you said it first. You changed it. Conquest. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. What is um? <laughs> thank you. What is? Uh, I heard common. You stopped it. What is uh, acquisition by conquest? Um, I mean to 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 take it essentially by being stronger. What do you mean? So. Columbus rolls in, native people living on the island. How do you con how, how is it conquest here? Conquest? How, how, how do you conquer it? <coughs> kill them. Right, you see people have to kill it, right? Um, eventually, unless you have some sort of government or some sort of system of laws to uh, uh, manage disputes, you have what you call alternative dispute resolution, which is killing people, right? Uh, it's much more preferable to have law resolving conflicts, but uh, once law runs out, uh, you go to the sword. 
um, which is a fact of life. Okay? So, where have we been so far? We've been 45 minutes. You got cookies and a name tag. What else have we learned today, right? Um, the basis we have of property is largely premised on this notion of first in time. You're hunting foxes, drilling <coughs> oil, looking for land. The first person to acquire it usually gets it. Today's class is a little bit different, though. Right? What happens if there are people already occupying the land? Is there any questions that before we go into Johnson? You thought there was one case that was a big piece of cake. No, 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 no. Uh, you have to read very carefully, read the notes carefully. There should be a lesson for that. Um, more often than not, the notes are more important than the case. So please read everything assigned. It's natural. All right, any questions so far? All right, uh, Lucas? All right, uh, talking about Johnson versus Macintosh, what, what's going on there? Uh, basically, it's talking about how we, how America got started. Ah. And okay, let's go down that road. How did America get started? Tell me. Uh, it all started with Europeans coming over uh, and getting the land used by France. Okay. Um, there's a principle of basically just coming over. Um, and it was all because the queen or the king gave the power. They didn't open the dominion over them. Oh. So it didn't matter if the tribes were over there because they didn't care about it. They thought we're Europeans, we're the smartest, we're the strongest, so we're just going to come over, take dominion, and once we do that, that's our own. Okay. Uh, Marcella? Yeah. Marcella, does the court hold that the Indians are not allowed to live? on the land that they were native to? No. Are they allowed to keep living where they're living? No, they're not. What's the court hold here? Does the court hold that the Indians must leave the land, that they're not allowed to live there? No, they still live there, but they don't have the ability to get the land anymore. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, right? How can you have the power to live on a piece of property, but not the power <coughs> to sell it to someone else? How is it even possible? I don't, I don't understand what that even means. Uh, how, how can it be? that you're allowed to live on property, but you're not allowed to sell it. How is that supposed to work? Samantha? Can you think of an example of where that might take place today? I can give an example. Where do you live? I live in Houston. Uh, house, apartment? A house. You, you own it? No. You rent it? My mother owns it. Okay, that works. So you're allowed to live there? Yes. Could you yeah. sell the house by yourself? No, because I don't have the authority to do so. You don't, why don't you? Because I'm not the person on the name of the mortgage. No, you're not. <coughs> right, so if you tried selling the house, I think your mom would be mad at you? Fair. Okay. So it's actually not that bizarre of a concept, right? A lot of you rent apartments, right? Could you sell your rental unit? Of course not. So one of the concepts in property that I'm hitting at really early on is there's different types of ownership. You might have the power to live on a plot of land, but you can't sell it. You can't invite someone else to live on it, right? You might be able to have a house guest, but you can't add someone else to your lease without your mother's permission. Or, or in your case, your, 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 your landlord's permission, your mom's permission, right? What the court's getting at here is that there are different types of ownership. So the Indians here are able to live in the land, but they don't have the power to sell it. The question then, Kelly, is why? Why do the native people here not have the power to sell the land that they discovered. They were there first, they viewed it with their eye, they saw it. Why don't they have the power to sell the land that they're on? That is moving towards the core of this case. Um, because the Europeans didn't see their ownership as valid. Why not? Mm. Why not? <coughs> Why did the Europeans not see their 
claim to the land is valid enough to support the ability to sell. Um, because there are savages? Why? What, what, what difference does it make if they're savages? Um, these are not real people that can have real ownership in <coughs> Dylan, on what basis does the court hold that these natives, the savages, as Kelly said, lack the ability to sell property? Um, is it because it, they like live different lives than the Europeans do? What do you mean live different lives? Like they were like <coughs> less, in their eyes, they were like a lesser human than these Europeans were. And on what basis did Chief Justice Marshall, the great Chief Justice, by the way, you don't have me for common law. Um, John Marshall was the second most overrated justice of all time. Definitely <laughs> Oliver, Oliver won the Holmes, close second. Uh, but very much overrated is one of the reasons why. What law, Dylan, is, is a Holmes? <coughs> is Marshall applying to reach this conclusion that these are savages and they're, they're not entitled to any property rights to sell? What, what law is he applying? What law? Is there a statute? No. No. Um, what's your name tag? Yeah, just come to your right? The people too. Yeah. So is that, is that Katie? Katie, what law is Chief Justice Marshall applying here? This is what, 1823. Is there a statute in the books that he's applying? Um, I don't think that they were really applying the law to that. Kind of previously, like the Europeans, the way they treated them. Why? How is that law? Have you ever read an opinion like this before? In all of your years of law school, you have one semester, right? Yeah. In all of your, in all of your one semester of law school, you've never read an opinion like that. There's no statute. There's no precedent. There's no case law. There's no common law doctrine. What's what, Katie? What is he citing? What is he looking at here? Just history, I guess. Lance, you gotta help me out. What relevance is it to an American court, the U.S. Supreme Court, right? About what the Spanish Queen did, and what the French King did, and what England did with the King. What <coughs> relevance is this historical practice to questions of American contract? This is a contract case, right? Right. You have, you, have this, you have dueling contracts, contract A, contract B. Which one is correct? Which one do you enforce? Right? It's a contracts question, right? Battle of forms, right? Um, flashback, right? <laughs> 207, whatever. This is a contract case. Lance, why are they looking to France and Spain and England? What relevance is this to an American court of law applying contract law? Because that's where our law comes from. Says who? Uh, you haven't studied much constitutional law, but you don't need to. Um, I can assure you there's nothing in the Constitution about this, right? There's no statute about this, right? Alec, why does the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Marshall, the great Chief Justice, right? Why does the great Chief Justice feel compelled to look to the practices of Spain and France and England in reaching this conclusion? Um, I would say that their systems of government that unite them about, I guess, religion and like godly men would, would be how they would act. But why is that relevant that there's certain principles that unite them? Why is that relevant? Because they want to see what systems work. Oh, wait a minute. You're onto something. What do you mean what systems work? Like they want to see what civilizations were like countries have had a system in place that has been able to carry, carry on throughout time. And Stephanie, what? why does it matter if certain civilizations have used these rules for years. Why is that relevant? Um, they, they were effective. What if they were not effective? Would people keep using them? But the fact that people kept using them means what? Okay. This is how the common law works. You never thought about this, right? The rules you study in various common law cases aren't there because they're the best rule or the correct rule. They're there because they work. And people like them, right? The reason why common law judges keep following the same rule is because people like them, right? You read Hadley v. Baxendale, right, in contracts with expected damages. That's probably the wrong outcome, but it's a rule people like, and they keep following it. 
<laughs> what Marshall is trying to do here, right? What Marshall is trying to do here is reason from first principles. What is the best rule to apply in this case? There's no statute. There's no case law to apply. He's looking to whatever he can. Laws of nature, right? Laws of God. John Locke, King of Queens, King of Queens, the King of Spain, right? Whatever it happens to be, he's looking to those sources. To those sources to figure out a rule. Right? Is it Harrison? Yeah. So by looking to all these sources, what rule does he put up? What, what's the rule that he establishes? Um, that uh, basically the right of discovery gives you the coordinates of the land. So if you discover the land first. Good. But why does the right of discovery apply? Right? What about discovery makes you get the property? We already did this, but I want to hit it again. What about discovery makes you get it? Um, <coughs> uh, I mean, because no one prior to discovery, no one owned it, so by right when you discover it, you can assert your claim upon that. Land. Okay. So, um, Miranda, let me try it like this. Why couldn't the rule be, pick one up, right? If you discover land, it's yours for 10 years, and after they give it to someone else. Why couldn't that be the rule? Isn't that a Marshall made up a rule, I can make up a rule, right? You discover land, it's yours for 10 years, and then you have to give it up to the person that gets it afterwards. Why is that not a good rule for Marshall to adopt? Well, but there's a lot of turnover there. Turnover. What's wrong with turnover? Well, then there's not continuity. Continuity. So what's one of the values that this discovery rule promotes? Then you can be assured who owns it. Certainty, right? Why is this discovery rule so popular? It provides certainty. You know that if you get the first, it's yours, right? So property rules often serve various values. I think Miranda hit it quite well. Certainty, continuity, you know for sure who owns a piece of land, okay? But is, uh, Jordan, Jordan, what's one of the downsides of this rule of discovery, though? What if, like, you know, you and Miranda are racing this island on a boat, and, like, you know, you get like a broken sail, so you get there one day later. Up, oh, you're out of luck. <coughs> and she got there first, so it's hers forever. And her heirs get it, and their heirs get it, etc. What's the downside to this rule that's saying if you own it first, it's yours forever, and your heirs get it? What's wrong with that? It's not fair. It's not fair. <laughs> She's exactly right. Uh, I often refer to fair as the F word. I don't like using it uh, because it doesn't mean anything. But Kids have the sense, it's not fair, she gets it, I don't get it, right? It's not fair. So the rule of discovery is certain, but it's not fair, right? And very often, people are screwed. They, they get the short end of the stick. For example, these, uh, the Indians on this, uh, on this continent. So the rule of discovery eventually runs into the wall, but what if other people are there? So hence, is that, is that Megan? Mm -hmm. Megan. We get to now the rule of conquest, rule of conquering. What's the rule there? How do we just, how does Marshall understand this rule of conquering? Um, so I know they talked about how there's not much left to discover mm -hmm. and that conquering is important and it gives the exclusive right to take the land from the Indians because they didn't see them, I guess, prior to the war as being able to own that land. So, Megan, let me ask a follow-up, please. Um, Jordan said, and I agree with her, that the discovery was not fair, right? Miranda got there five minutes before and that's hers. Is the conquest rule fair? No. Why not? <laughs> because it leads to discriminatory practices. Okay, what do you mean? So, who's to say that someone isn't able to have complete ownership over a man? Mm -hmm. Or because they live a certain way or have certain social customs that mm -hmm. we shouldn't treat them like equals <clears throat> as far as what's their property or what they But if you're on the battlefield, isn't it all fair in love and war? <laughs> Neiman, you see, shaking your head, yes, right? Yeah. Is a battle fair? Yes. Is it? Yes. Is each side <laughs> <laughs> fight to the death, right? What, what if the sides aren't equally matched, so to speak, in terms of firepower? 
you know, one side has, the other side has, you know, swords. And it's not fair in theory, but it's a mutual understanding that yeah. that's what it's going to take. Do you want to see Wonder Woman? I, I, I want to like the play. Didn't the opening scene where they were with bows and arrows and guns? I, no. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Uh, was that? David and Goliath? Yeah, David and the slingshot, I suppose. Um, but I think Neiman and Megan raise a fair point, right? Is the conquest doctrine actually fair? Uh, it's perhaps fairer than the discovery because leave a fighting chance, so to speak. Um, but it does provide certainty, for sure. Because if you're victorious in battle, uh, to the victor go to spoils. Right? So Marshall sketches these two doctrines, right? This discovery doctrine and this conquest doctrine as uh, various ways that property can be acquired. But they're both premised, and you've all hit on this before, the idea that the Indians are the age of savages, right? Now, um, I want to dig on that a little bit more. Is that Brittany? Yes. Brittany, why does Marshall insist that the uh, natives are savages, right? What, what, what attributes about them makes them so inferior in the mind of the Chief Justice? Okay, what else? They didn't have much organization. Okay, now I have the right track. What do you mean organization? They didn't have the same type of sovereign nation, essentially, that Europe had. Good. And what was the relationship, in Marshall's mind, of the natives to the, to the property? They were just occupants. Mm, good. They were Sorry, hungry. Yeah. Eat cookies. <laughs> they were good. Yeah, they were, excellent answer. Good cookies, too. Um, they were occupants. What do you mean occupants? They, um... It was, I wrote in my notes about the occupancy theory, and so mm -hmm. about being there first, and they just had occupancy. They didn't have any title, they didn't have any rights to Good. it. Good. How did the natives, how that. did the natives use land from season to season? Migrated or? Bingo, bingo, migrated, right. So the way Marshall describes it is that the natives didn't have the same sense of property as the Europeans. Right? Europeans have this notion that I have title to this land, I'm going to live on it, my children are going to live on it, my grandchildren are going to live on it, and so on and so on and so on. According to Marshall, the natives didn't have that scheme of property. They were migrants, use Brittany's words, right? They would migrate from lot to lot to lot. So maybe in this season they would hunt here, and that season they'd hunt here. They didn't have fixed cities, right? They didn't have fixed um, uh, uh, governments. They, they, they moved around a lot. Okay? That's not exactly true. Now, I complained before that the 8th edition of the book had stuff that was taken out the ninth edition. I will give it to you. So you should be happier reading shorter, but I'll, I'll give it to you anyway. Um, uh, uh, it was a very common misconception that the native lacked any scheme of property. It's just, it's not accurate. Um, a lot of the uh, Indians who lived in Canada were trappers. They would hunt animals for fur. When fur became a fairly valuable commodity, the natives started to recognize that overhunting was a problem. <coughs> right? A any hunters in the room? Right? Um, one of the aspects of overhunting is if too many people try to hunt in a given area, what happens? If you run out, right? The population declines. And animals don't just pop up out of nowhere, they have to breed and reproduce. So if you cull the level too deep, you basically wipe out the population. The natives were very much attuned to this. They were aware of it. And they handled it in a fairly um, sophisticated manner. They would mark off certain areas of the woods for their tribe to hunt. They would put us, what they would do is they basically burn a, a symbol onto a tree. Maybe it was a star, maybe it was a crescent, right? Whatever the symbol was, or some symbol. And that symbol said, hey, XYZ tribe, we're hunting here for this season. And then a competing tribe that came by said, oh, wait a minute, that's the symbol of XYZ tribe. I'm not going to go there. What does this remind you of, Texas? <laughs> Branding, yeah. You ever go to a ranch in Texas? You got a brand. A horse or a cow has a symbol on it. And if you know if you find this cow in the wild, or this horse in the wild, it belongs to XYZ Ranch. And I don't know if horse thieving is still a hanging offense, uh, but, but at one point it was. 
So the basic notion of Marshall's opinion that the savage Indians had no system of property as a factual matter is, is, is just wrong. But it did form the basis of his opinion. Now, uh, Grace, we'll go back to you. Why do you think Marshall had to go out of his way to disparage the Indians so much? And so these people are not able to sell land, not able to make contracts at all. Why do you think he had to go? I mean, he went out of his way to make that. He could have done this a lot easier, right? Spared you some reading. Why did he make these points so vigorously? I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean. So, like, he's saying that because they moved around and they did these different things, that they didn't own that. That, that, that's true, but, but answer the question. Why did he have to make such a big deal about them being unable to contract, right? Why did he have to go down that road? To make it so that their initial contract of land was in Exactly. Very good. Right? Um, you all remember from contract the doctrine of um, children can't make contracts, right? Minors. They, they lack capacity. If you're under 18 and you make a contract, whatever the law of the state, the contract's not valid. Marshall describes the natives in the same terms you would describe a minor purpose of contract. They're, 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 they're just not capable of contracting. Everyone get that much, right? The reason why he had to disparage these people is basically children. I mean, that's what they, they're, they're, they're stupid kids, right? They don't know what the hell they're doing. The reason why he had to disparage them in this fashion was to make it clear that no contract signed by a native would be valid in an American court, right? He wasn't only making a ruling about this case with Johnson and McIntosh, right, Kendrick? He was making a much broader ruling. What was the ruling he was making as a, as a as Supreme Court Chief Justice? What was he getting at there? Well, it's just exactly what you said, so that there's no confusion anywhere. And it's just to clarify the fact that you need to go through somebody else. You can't use, like, their word. It's not the official law. Very good. What the court was trying to do here was settle a number of disputes. And all these disputes centered on this question, were the contracts signed by the natives <coughs> valid in American courts? Okay, think about the possibilities. What if those contracts were valid? Right, so is that, um, is that Aaron? Yeah. So imagine, right, you had a contract from the Native American tribe to one party, and a contract from the US government to the other party. This happened all the time. Right? Basically, the natives sold land, they thought, or who knows what they were selling. And the government's going, no, 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 that contract's not valid. You're a judge, right? You're a judge somewhere in the US. You have contract A that was earlier in time, had all the formalities of sign, still deliver. You have contract B from the US government. Usually, if you have an earlier contract and a later contract for the same widget, what, what prevails? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the earlier contract prevails. But what is Marshall signaling? How should courts now treat any competing contracts signed by natives? As invalid. Bingo. They want to see that, right? What he's saying is, as a matter of course, all land contracts from the natives are void. Void ab initio, they may. They were void from the moment they were signed. And as a result, in every case, a land grant from the government will prevail over a land grant from a native tribe. Okay? This decision, which Marshall perhaps regretted later in life, and you note about this in your book, basically paved the way for westward expansion. Right? This was only 1823. <clears throat> Manifest destiny all the way to the west coast. This said to the Indians, any deal you made to sell your land is now nullified. And any future transaction that you might want to make is not going to happen. Because if you're a land developer, you're not going to buy land from an Indian tribe. It's not going to be honored in court. So you're going to buy land from the government instead. <coughs> this opinion paved the way for westward expansion. Okay. It also represented a disruption of significant amounts of property rights for people who had already de dealt with the Indians. Um, and it also established this very strange principle of how are Indians connected to American law. I think I asked this at the very outset of class. 
Uh, 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 yeah. So even though the alien, uh, aliens, the Indians couldn't sell the land, what could they do? Buy it. Well, they couldn't. No, or they couldn't buy it. Could. What were they allowed to do? They couldn't sell their own land. What could they do? Well, if they, don't, if they can't sell it, they can't give it away. But what were they allowed to do? What did Marshall say they could do for sure? Um, no? no? Is that a choice? Um, what could the Indians do on the land? Have you got anything anymore? They could. Very little. Yeah. Thanks. Work here. Uh, Is that a... Uh, Cheyenne. Cheyenne? What could they do? Could they live there? They could live there. This formed the basis of what we now know as reservations, right? That it's a species of land. They can't really sell it, but they're allowed to live there, right? Now, uh, Indian tribes are considered sovereign nations. It's a, it's, a, it's a curious aspect of American law, where you have basically nations unto themselves. They have their own laws, their own courts, their own uh, 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 everything. Um, it's a very unique aspect of American <coughs> law, but it created this separateness. Now, one of the consequences of being able to live on the land but not sell it is that you can be kicked off it pretty easily, All right? The government can control who enters the land and who exits the land, and they can kick you off of it. So one of the consequences of not having the right to own the land by yourself and to sell it do whatever you wish is you're not stable. And many of the transactions, the contracts that the um, uh, settlers signed with the Indians, which were nullified, basically meant the Indians to be kicked off the land at any point. And that's largely what happened over the next hundred odd years. Okay. So questions on Johnson. Questions on Johnson? Uh, yes, Celeste? Um, was one of the, I was one, wanting to know if the reason why they said that the natives had no right to it was because they didn't um, cultivate the land, they didn't change uh, it, right? They lived yeah. in harmony with nature. So the Europeans came in and they labored the land. Since your labor is your property. Oh, no, you stole my next question. Yeah, I'll get there in two minutes. Let, let me put your question on hold brief. I'll come back to the two minutes, I promise. Any other questions other than Locke? I was going to get there really quick. All right. So, right. So to summarize, the, the black letter holding of, of, of uh, John Tiberius Macintosh is that land can be acquired through discovery or conquest. Indeed, the Europeans discovered and conquered the United States. That Indians were living there is fine. They can live there. They were, they were there first. But as an act of conquest, they now have the ability to sell it. And the conquered cannot sell their own land. Everyone with me? Now, Celeste raised a very good point. So just repeat your question if you may have forgotten it. Um, I'm saying that the reason, one of the reasons or explanations they gave was that because the natives lived in harmony with nature and they didn't cultivate it or change it, that when Europeans came in, since Europeans saw your own labor as ownership, mm -hmm. then when they changed the land or modified it, then they own, they had, uh, it kind of goes back to discovery, like they discovered it first because yeah. I modified it. Very good. So what Celeste is discussing is a, uh, um, a theory that's known as labor theory. Here's Mr. Wong. Right? It's known as Locke or Lockean labor theory. <coughs> and Celeste articulated quite well. So let's go back to our deserted island, right? And there are two people on this island. And they're both hunting a fox. They're both <coughs> chasing a fox. Right? One person spent the entire day trapping the fox, running after it, laying traps. Okay? And he finally cornered the fox in a cave, cornered him. And then at the last minute, some jerk stops by, the other guy, and he goes in the caves and steals the fox. Who gets the fox? Well, under the rule of first in time, the jerk gets it, because he caught it first, he got there first. But under this idea of labor theory, of improving and putting your own labor into it, the hunter should get it, because he spends all this time. 
this is part of the court's analysis in Marshall's opinion, right? He says, look, these native people have not cultivated the land. They haven't built cities. They haven't developed farms. They were mostly uh, hunters, right? And they're migrants who move from place to place. Whereas the colonists, the Americans, cultivated the land. They improved it. So in this theory, right, even though the natives got there first, they didn't mix their labor with the land. The colonists got there second, but because they were putting all this time into it, they actually acquired a property right. So under the Lockean theory, you don't even need to be first in time if you invest the labor into it. And Marshall's opinion was, he didn't cite Lock, but there's a very strong Lockean trend to it. By putting your labor, by investing your energy into improving land, you actually get it. Now, uh, is that Madison? Yes. Hi. So what is then the problem, though, with this sort of Lockean approach? Why, why might courts not want to make this the rule of law, that if you invest your labor in something, you get it? What, what's problematic about that? Well, like, it's hard to, it's difficult to prove. It is. Why is it difficult to prove? Because if, <coughs> just going back to the fox example, you can't really necessarily prove that you chased around the fox and tracked him all day. How much labor do you have to invest for it to be enough to get? Hunted for two hours, four hours, eight hours. What if you lied? What if you weren't actually trapping and just made it up to get the fox with no cameras back then? Right? So, while the... Acquisition by discovery is very certain, right? I think Jordan said that a few minutes ago on Miranda. It's a very certain doctrine. It's not fair. But the labor theory is the opposite. It's very fair. You're rewarding the person with the labor in it, but it's not certain because you can't quite measure it. All right, so these are two sides of the same coin, right? The discovery doctrine, first in time, it's very certain but not fair. The labor theory... <laughs> It is very fair, but not certain. And so these are some of the competing commands that I want you all to think about throughout this semester, right? Marshall goes with the discovery rule. First things first, certain. Europeans got there. They conquered. They came, they saw, they conquered. But if you apply a labor theory, um, is that Shana? Mm -hmm. Shana, let me ask you a follow-up question, please. What if the Indians start developing the land and they build farms and agriculture and everything else. How would that change the situation? Yeah. So that could have worked out not so good, right? If the natives started developing the land accordingly under Locke's theory, they could actually gain a right to it. That is, there's empty land not being used. You give it to the person putting it to the best use. Okay? So you have these two theories, right? You have this first in time rule, you also have the Lockean labor theory rule. Um, these doctrines were very influential among early thinkers to understand how property is acquired. Um, throughout the course of the semester, we'll keep going back to Mr. Locke um, many, many times. All right, so questions on lock. <clears throat> All right, so um, let me summarize um, uh, a bit for the day and let you get out. Um, the rules we're covering here uh, didn't appear overnight. Um, they developed over thousands of years, in large measure because they serve different values. Some of these rules promote fairness, the labor theory. Some of these rules promote certainty, like the first in time rule, the discovery rule. And knowing when to apply these is often a factor of what sort of value you're trying to promote. Um, no one theory is right or better than the other. They have different pros and cons. Um, what the Johnson case illustrates is how a very early U.S. Supreme Court decision applied these principles. And the effect of this principle was to reach probably what the Federalists thought was the best outcome. Um, the Indians couldn't transact land. That means that westward expansion was possible. So you don't need to see this as necessarily the correct decision, the best decision, but it reflects very often the common law. It served a value that was important at the time, which we can look back today and criticize. Um, your readings for next class will be a lot simpler. Um, they'll involve hunting of ducks and whales 
and baseballs, right? If you hit a ball into the stand, who catches it, who gets it, or if there's a fight over the ball. Um, these are cases that are a lot easier to understand but the same principle, right? You adopt a rule that's about fairness, right? Whoever touches the ball first gets it. Or a rule about certainty, right? I know he got it, he was there first. Um, these are tough rules to apply. All right, any other questions? All right, if you didn't figure out the attendance, please come talk to me. If you didn't get a name tag, please come talk to me. And if you want to talk, come talk to me also. Thank you very much.